Isn't it funny how things change? There was a time when the rural pursuits of hunting, shooting and fishing were accepted without question as a part of the British way of life. But then, most people still had a family link with the countryside, parents, an aged aunt or country cousins. Now, in a nation where 85% of the population is completely urbanised and such links have disappeared, the vast majority of people have no real idea of their social history, rural life, or even the source of the food they eat. <laughs> Take shooting, for instance. Ask your average man in the street what he thinks of shooting sports, and the chances are he'll simply shrug his shoulders or reply with a well-hackneyed phrase picked up from some newspaper or television programme to the effect that it ought to be stopped. After all, he doesn't do it, so why should anyone else? A variation of the I'm all right, Jack theme, if you like. Well, here we are on the morning of a shoot. As far as the nearby cover crops and coverts are concerned, today is harvest time. Because like the sheep and fattened cattle in the surrounding fields and the pigs at the farm, some of the game birds living in these fields and coverts are about to become meat for someone's table. Taking wild game for the table has always been the practice of the countrymen. And in due course, the skills acquired in this pursuit were refined and governed by certain rules. So it is with shooting. The appearance of firearms in the 14th century led to their use for the taking of game in addition to the snare, the bow and the trap. The aristocracy, who had developed the sport of falconry for taking their birds, rabbits and hares for the pot, disdained other methods and the early sporting gun, the long fowling piece that was in use by 1500, was regarded as no more than a mere cottager's tool. It was not until the return of King Charles II from France, after the death of Cromwell led to the restoration of the monarchy, that shooting fowl evolved as a sport in this country. In this respect, we lagged far behind the continent, especially France, but things soon began to change. Not only did the British refine their fowling pieces and shooting skills to enable them to take birds on the wing, rather than stalking up to them on the ground as they had done previously, they began to breed game birds as a supplement to the wild stock of partridge and pheasant. All the shooting was then walked up, the shooter seeking his game with the aid of a brace of pointers or setters, and this was the style of sporting shooting throughout the 1700s and well into the 1840s. A leisurely and even paced approach that was well suited to the tempo of the muzzle loaders then in use. Okay, I'll leave you with the rest because yeah. um, okay. Mark's got to sort out his stock. Yeah, he's yeah. yeah. got his flag. Tom? So if I take my three with me, go and do them couple of eggs, Rose. Sit down. Just take what you need. The guns may have changed since those times, but there remains a certain formality of dress and demeanour that has lingered on from those punctilious times. Like the keeper and his beaters, the guests are also expected to be up early and to arrive punctually. This is not due to any anachronistic sense of ceremony. The host and his staff have gone to a great deal of trouble in organising the day and the least the guests can do is arrive in good time. In these days of motorised transport and instant foods, it is perhaps easy to forget that the pace of this day is governed by the natural rhythm of sunrise and sunset.
After introductions, it is time to draw lots for position. Each shooter will be assigned a number for the peg marking his position on the various drives. There will be three drives today, two in the morning and one in the afternoon. Two up every time, please, six. While the peg numbers are being drawn, it is traditional to serve slow gin, although perhaps drinking and shooting should be mutually exclusive activities. Pegs allocated, and those shooters who felt in need of a warming slow gin provided for, it is time to join the keeper and his staff out on the estate, and the party make their way to the first drive of the day. <laughs> Jasper, my son. All right, nice and steady. Yep. The quarry on the organized shoot is flushed and driven over the guns by beaters, as has been the practice since the middle of the last century. We can see as the first drive of the day commences, how carefully organized the beaters are so that the birds, pheasants on this occasion, are persuaded to take a line that will bring them to the waiting shooters. Sit down. The pheasant is essentially a bird of the ground and prefers to rely on showing a clean pair of heels to escape danger rather than using its wings. Although it roosts in the comparative safety of trees, keeping well above the ground, it is probable that it is only learnt to do so to avoid predators. When roused, however, and given the chance to gain height, the pheasant is a fast and strong flyer over a short distance. You can see how a few seconds of vigorous flight is followed by a long glide interspersed with short, rapid wing beats as these birds are flushed out from this covert. The pheasant's fast climbing flight pattern is what the beaters must put to best advantage when driving the birds. Really high pheasants, birds at least 40 yards up, present one of the most difficult of shots and often there is a certain degree of good-natured rivalry between the keeper and his beaters and the shooters trying to down these high curling birds. Many a bird is anxiously watched by the keeper, who, as we see, can be awfully smug about those that escape to live another day. The essence of this sport is its very uncertainty. These birds have been bred for the table just as much as this year's lambs. The long months of careful breeding and nurturing this year's birds is taken as seriously as is raising any other livestock. The only difference is that these birds are not about to end their days in the slaughterhouse. As they claw their way up through the trees and fly high into the air, more than one pair of eyes is willing them to sail clear of the shot charge directed at them from below. This bird, as we can see, has clearly escaped the pot for now. Yeah. 
The first drive over, the shooters make their way to their positions for the next drive, and the beaters get ready to make their way through the adjacent coverts. This morning's shoot has seen the keeper have his beaters out early to drive the birds into the coverts. The drive has been carefully and successfully carried out, and a fair number of birds have been put over the line of shooters. There are four principles involved in successfully beating pheasants for a reasonable day's shooting to be had. First, they must be pushed as far as possible on their feet and brought back on the wing. Secondly, they must be driven away from home and then flushed homewards. Thirdly, they must be flushed at a considerable distance from the shooters in order to give them time to gain height. And lastly, they should, if possible, be flushed from a higher ground than that on which the shooters, or guns if you prefer, are placed. As the drive commences, it can be seen how tightly some of these birds will sit, the beaters almost having to winkle them out one by one. Every bush, every clump of tall grass needs to be investigated if a decent number of birds are to be put up. The real skill, though, is ensuring that birds flush in the right direction and at the right time. Again, every effort is made to flush the birds well forward of the shooters. Done this way, not only will a reasonable number of birds be presented, but they will also be given a sporting chance of escaping the pot. The sport of shooting is not the killing of easy birds by indifferent shots, but of driving the birds over at a heightened speed that makes them as difficult a target as possible. Now compare that with an animal going into the slaughterhouse. There are those who justify the slaughtering of domesticated animals for meat by telling you that they are bred to die. The gamekeeper is doing exactly what the livestock farmer does. At least the game birds he rears are given as much freedom as a wild bird has and are given a fair chance when the time comes to send them to the game dealers. Good bird there, didn't he? Yeah, good bird that was. Yeah, that's it, Jeff. 
The second drive of the morning completed, it is time to go for lunch while the disturbance caused by the morning shooting settles down again. So where I take the main down first, is out on the left. In that brink, yeah, on the left. And just that hedge over there, where the field is. This shoot on Devon's Holland Estate is run on traditional lines for the family and guests by invitation only. Gone are the days of the numbers game, the huge bags of the late Victorian and Edwardian times, where estates were more interested in attracting the best shots of the day and the attendant social scene than anything else. The days of the big shoots may have gone, but something remains of the traditions and social etiquette of those times, and there remains fairly strict rules about one's dress at the more formal venues, just as going to the opera and even dining out at some of the more exclusive restaurants imposes similar rules. The unwritten rules also apply to the choice of gun, and it has to be said that the traditional side-by-side -side game gun remains the most acceptable, though the over and under has gained in both popularity and acceptance in recent years. Each type has its own advantages, and in the end, the choice is governed by what the shooter is used to or gets the best results with. The enormous popularity of clay pigeon shooting has undoubtedly been the cause of the over and under's widespread use. It is the most commonly used gun for that sort of shooting, and not surprisingly, the number of people using them for game shooting is increasing. However, some would still argue that the light, fast handling and more elegant side-by-side -side is still the better choice. The one type of gun that is unlikely to be welcome on a formal shoot these days is the repeater. It was not always so, since when the first repeating gun appeared over here in the mid-1880s, it was regarded with an open mind. The gun concerned was the American-made Spencer pump action, and it was introduced into this country by one of the most innovative London makers of the time, the firm of Charles Lancaster. It was a good gun, and very successful in its country of manufacture. But the British sportsmen have always been a conservative lot, and consequently the Spencer sold in relatively small numbers over here. There was, however, none of the prejudice in the best circles against the pump action that there is now, since in the 1880s any new breech-loading gun attracted interest. <laughs> Yeah, he's got, got something. Got to be more than that. 
Go to the, right to the top of the top. Yeah. Are we doing Yeah. Are we doing yeah. Yeah. Right. You know which way to go? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 There are two things which attract people to shooting sports. Some may take it up because of social aspirations or see it as a form of corporate entertainment. However, not so the genuine gun shooter. The guns themselves are interesting, of course, and to appreciate them, one must have a fascination for mechanical things and an appreciation of quality, and history too, perhaps, since it is very noticeable that many game shooters have an interest in old guns and their associated paraphernalia. You may even see an old black powder hammer gun or even a muzzle loading gun brought out from time to time on the less formal occasions. The other attractions are perhaps less easily explained. The fun is certainly in hitting a difficult target or trying to. And anyone who ever had a catapult as a child will have some sense of this. The antis would try and convince the world that the sportsman or woman simply enjoys killing, but that's about as wide of the mark as it is possible to get. No one enjoys killing an animal or bird any more than the slaughterman enjoys that part of his work. But there remains the fact that if you wish to eat meat, then something has to be killed to provide it. Some of those who shoot are as indifferent to their quarry as the housewife picking up a joint of meat in the supermarket is to the fate of the animal it came from, while others can feel a regret but may take consolation when the pheasant reappears as a delicious roast bird from the oven. Most people, one suspects, fall somewhere in between. The third part of the attraction of pheasant shooting, as with all field sports, lies in the sense of occasion and of belonging. After all, countless generations before us have been preserving and cropping the game of these islands, and by so doing have ensured the survival of the countryside we hold so dear. 
The bad practices of the past, the excessively harsh control of predatory species and disgracefully large bags have been eliminated. And although the conservation aspects were quite incidental in the past, today they are an important benefit of all game rearing. Today, private shoots such as this one are a tiny minority. Within the past 70 years, the shoot has changed greatly. Through the 19th century and well into this one, game shooting was almost entirely retained in private hands. Those of the aristocracy, the landed gentry, farmers and their friends. And nowadays, this position is largely reversed. Groups of friends get together to absorb the cost of rearing the birds and forming shooting syndicates. In this case, the landowner or farmer will not necessarily be directly involved in the process, but the results are the same. Land is left alone to remain natural habitat and some of the pressure is taken off the remaining land. The birds go to the game merchant or butcher to end up on the dining table. That was a good drive, wasn't it? It's a good drive. Fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Oi, Jack. Yeah. That was that thing, Monsoor. It's a good drive, wasn't it? Oi, Jack. I hope they hit someone. Yeah, go on. I hope they hit someone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, got two of them working down there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, they'll be down. Oh, that was a good one, wasn't it? Today, shoots such as this one are an important influence against some of the worst of modern farming practices. The rearing and cropping of game in this fashion is both a creative and productive pastime. The pheasant accounts for about 87% of the quarry shot in this country, with the partridge following quite a way behind in second place. Without grouse shooting on the moorlands of the north of England, Wales and Scotland, there would be a very real danger that much of our heather upland habitat would disappear, as the only alternative economic use for such land by today's terms is to plant forests of conifers on it. The natural habitat and its fauna, of course, is destroyed by such a practice. The pheasant and partridge shoot confer similar benefits. Farmers are encouraged to leave hedgerows and headlands intact and not to spray close to them with the toxic chemicals of which modern agribusiness is so fond. The Game Conservancy at Fordingbridge has worked hard and successfully to reverse certain modern farming practices and landowners have been encouraged to develop their land for shooting syndicates. Because the land has therefore become more profitable financially, this has lessened the pressure on landowners to develop commercial forests or to drain and develop marginal land for agricultural use. <laughs> At the end of the day, the birds are collected together and the shoot members and their guests make their way back to the house for the end of day spread. Beaters, keepers and guns meet to discuss the day's shooting and now is the time to tip the gamekeeper. As for the pheasant, it has been bred in this country for its meat ever since the Romans introduced it here for that purpose. Only the manner of taking it for the table has changed. Most sporting shooting in this country is of the pot hunting sort, where one or perhaps two sportsmen and a dog walk up their own quarry. The numbers of game taken in this fashion on any one outing will be small, no more than are required for family and friends, and it has been the main way for a countryman to put extra meat on the table for hundreds of years. Days like today's shoot are a grand occasion for the sportsmen lucky enough to be invited to take part, but they are also the means by which the restaurants and poulterers are supplied with birds for the town dweller's table. Each guest receives a brace of birds from the keeper. The rest of them will go off to the dealer. The end of another successful day for the Holland shoot, and long may such days continue in the future. But what of the future? 
Game shooting, like hunting, is now widespread among people of all walks of life. The old comment that such things are only for the rich no longer holds true. So the politics of envy that were once the root of much of the criticism of the sport no longer apply. The conservation benefits of game shooting, once entirely incidental to the preservation of game, have assumed a new importance in the face of changed farming practices and a dwindling countryside under pressure from urban development. These benefits are recognised by the Nature Conservancy and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the preserved lowland coverts for the pheasant, the hedgerows and farming headlands left unsprayed to allow the partridge to thrive, the management practices of the grouse moorland. All these things are of benefit not only to the game species, but also of immense value to a wealth of bird, mammal and insect life. The shooting community too takes its responsibilities seriously. The British Association of Conservation and Shooting, BASC for short, runs courses throughout the country to teach safe shooting practices. And it has also drawn up a number of guidelines concerning bag limits and such like. Their efforts, those of the Game Conservancy and of the shooting community themselves, ensure that game shooting of all types puts much more into the countryside than it ever takes out, which is much more than can be said of most of man's activities.